All right, we're the ACG is going to present now their new pamphlet called Food, Health and Capitalism, COVID-19 and Beyond. We wrote this pamphlet just recently, obviously during the pandemic, because we we're concerned that even though people rightly so are concerned about the immediate issues of how to get food, worrying about having enough money and to live on and all those sorts of issues, plus their own immediate health, we felt that we needed to look at the root causes of the pandemic. For most of us, probably, I would say this pandemic came as a bit of a surprise. But for many scientists, the whole idea of the pandemic was not a surprise at all. If we'd actually read any of the stuff, which is not our normal reading material, it has to be said, that we would have been aware that something like this was just waiting to happen. And unfortunately, the more we research, the more we realize that if we don't take action, this could just be the tip of the iceberg in terms of pandemics. Really, when you look at COVID-19, the reason it's here is because of the way we produce our food and the kind of food we actually consume. This is, so it all comes down basically to our agricultural system. And the main reason behind, main issue with the way we produce and consume food is that food production is for profit, not for need. Not in all cases. There's really large sections of the world which are still based on uh, subsistence agriculture. Increasingly, sort of agri-capitalism, as we'll call it, is spread across the globe and is transforming how we see food. So it all comes to this, again, this word that many of us probably never knew, I certainly hadn't heard of it, zoonotic diseases. And the definition of it is a, a disease that's passed from other animals to humans. <clears throat> and what happens is you have these viruses and they, they will start in what they call a host or a reservoir animal. And the, these will be, have been there in that animal probably for quite a long time but without any uh, ill effects to that particular animal. But something will happen, some kind of close contact. And that virus, you know, this tiny little thing can jump to another animal. And then from the other animal, it will move to humans. So you have the virus and this virus that, that is moving in, can only exist in other organisms, can then in many circumstances actually cause diseases. Not in all circumstances, but obviously in the case of COVID-19. And it's referred to as spillover. So that's the sort of term people have used. It sort of spills over from one species to another. So now it is a little bit scary, really, because you're thinking, as soon as you start looking into these things, you're, you know, you don't see these things. And all of a sudden you realize that there's a whole lot of them about. And some of the reading said that there's actually more viruses than stars in the sky, at least the ones that we can see. So I don't really, we'll never know the truth of that. But the point is, is there's a, loads of them. And they've been around for as long as humans have, as long as or animals have been around and they've caused a lot of different diseases. So bubonic, bubonic plague is one of them. Rabies is you know, still with us, a major killer. Bird and swine flu, Ebola and AIDS, even the common cold, which uh, we've lived with for, for, for thousands of years. SARS, which is like COVID-19, is another respiratory disease. And so these examples of the kind of uh, diseases that can be caused by these viruses. And scientists uh, estimate there's 1.7 million undiscovered viruses in mammals and birds. So this is a real comforting thought to us all, really, at the moment. So the issue is, how do they cause disease? And the thing is, is viruses do not harm the host. I mean, they're living there quite happily together. But it's when they jump to this new organism that they can be lethal. So you could get it directly by touching an infected animal. So, for example, those people who worked with poultry were the ones to first uh, contract bird flu. It could be through an exchange of body fluids, for example, the blood, which is the cause of AIDS and Ebola. Or they could be airborne with coughing and sneezing. And this is the situation we're in at the moment. So how do you then go from this to an actual pandemic? It happens when this virus emerges in humans that we've never had before, so we have no immunity. And it has to be one that's capable of moving from human to human. Because often the virus might just move from the animal to one human. Does it move past that to other humans? And it has to be very contagious. 
and to make it a worldwide pan pandemic, obviously it needs to have global interconnections. And that's really what we've seen with COVID-19 is all four of these things have exist, which is what's made this one so particularly lethal to humanity. So let's look at a few of these. Any questions so far? I'm not actually a, an expert or a professional in any of these. It's m mainly through my own research, but I can try to answer questions. So the first one that, that's really around quite a lot is something called avian flu or, or bird flu. And this originates in wild birds and then affects domestic poultry. Oddly enough, the, one of the main sources is our, our friendly mallard which I must say, after having read that this for the first time about the mallard being one of the sources of it, made me a bit wary when you're going down to your local pond. But uh, somehow it goes from the, the wild fowl like the, the, the mallards into the domestic poultry. So the, it can be extremely deadly for animals. And you know, not only because animals start dying from it, but of course, once the people who are you know, producing those animals for food realize what's happening, they end up having to kill their whole stock of wildlife of, uh, animals. So I think, I think there was something in Malaysia when there was, I think it was a swine flu. I mean, they ended up killing over, you know, something like a million animals. So it can be very deadly for, for animals. And of course, the humans that will get them will be the ones who are actually working with them. But there hasn't been that much human to human transmission. So the poultry workers or the people working, you know, will get it, but it won't necessarily move from one human to another. So it did happen in the past. So for example, the, what they called the Spanish flu, which wasn't really Spanish flu at all, it's actually originated, they think in a poultry farm, maybe in the US even, was actually a kind of bird flu. And that did kill, they're still not even sure, you know, estimates go up to 100 million people. So that was after World War I, and uh, it killed more people than the actual war. So bird flu can be incredibly dangerous. Now, obviously, since then, they, they, they didn't even know it was a virus at the time because they hadn't actually invented the microscope to see viruses. They didn't really know quite what it was, but they now realize that it was a virus. And they have taken more steps to sort of keep an eye on things a bit more with, with the bird flu. However, because of this huge increase in factory farming all over the world, basically, that these outbreaks are becoming much more frequent. And the other problem, again, something that's quite complicated for people studying viruses, but the thing is viruses mutate. So scientists are, are worried that something that, okay, may enter, you know, one a few people who happen to be working with poultry or pigs, but it could be possible that these viruses mutate so they do become very contagious like the Spanish flu and move to human to human. So at the moment, actually, there is a concern in China that there is another outbreak of bird flu, which, of course, COVID-19 has overshadowed that. But these bird flu things are happening all the time. So what are the other mm -hmm. pandemics? Ebola was a big one in Africa and it killed many people. And the origin, as you can see here, you know, again, they, they, it took them a while to work out what the original host animal was. In the end, they realized that they think, I think they're still not completely sure, but that it's the bat was the host animal. And the bat then was would be something that then would somehow infect things like chimpanzees and gorillas. And there was loads of, we think of all the people that died from Ebola, but actually chimpanzees and gorillas in Central Africa were dying by the dozens. You know, they're already an endangered species, but they were getting it. And then what happened is that because people, one of the incidents that they talk about was in one of the villages that uh, some children and their dogs went off into the, to the forest and they, the, one of the dogs killed a chimpanzee. So they brought it back to the village because it's food and ate it. And about, I can't remember exactly how many people ate it, but um, of those, I think it was over 30 people had some part of that chimpanzee and those people died just from eating it.
So that was one, you know, one of the places where Ebola start, started. And because you could transmit a human to human, it then spread throughout the area. Now, AIDS, again, is something that they think came from chimpanzees and put, again, potentially originally from bats as well. And it's, it's transmitted very similar to Ebola. And it's over 35 million people that have died now of AIDS. And even though, again, it seems that COVID-19, people go on about it because it seems, oh, you know, it's global and all the people have been affected by it. But AIDS, first of all, and Ebola, oh, it's confined to Africa, first of all. So people weren't thinking about it that much, apart from the people obviously who were affected. And then for many people, it became known as the gay disease. So it just showed how people didn't take these things seriously because they thought it was a disease that happened to other people. Well, now that, you know, even politicians and everyone's getting COVID-19, all of a sudden, much more national, international coverage of the disease. But really, these were very widespread and are still are a you know, potential pandemic for Ebola and certainly with AIDS. MERS is actually comes from camels. And this is originated and largely confined to the Middle East, but it still killed a fair few people. Again, well below what we're seeing at the moment, but still enough people to be concerned about. And then SARS, you would have thought, which is so much like COVID-19, very, very similar, you would have thought that would have been some kind of warning to us all. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, we didn't very, learn very much from that. So that emerged in 2002, again, in the in Guangdong province of southern China. And this is really the first is a coronavirus. Some of these others are not actually coronaviruses. But it's the first one that was that really was causing harm because the common cold is a form of coronavirus. But this SARS was the first one that caused uh, the common cold. And scientists worked, you know, very dedicatedly to try to locate the reservoir animal. And they did find that the the reservoir animal was a bat, and the intermediate animal was the civet cat, um, something that people will eat in China. And it, it got quite far. It actually it killed, I think, about around 800 people, but not as many as what we have at the moment. They did manage to contain it somehow, and, uh, even though it went on and traveled as far as Canada and the, went into Southeast Asia. It, it didn't spread far enough for it to be as big as COVID-19. But unfortunately, the world's governments didn't learn from the example of SARS. And the origin of SARS, again, was in the wildlife markets of uh, Guangdong. And very soon after having originally closed them, all those markets were opened again. So what we're seeing really is now another coronavirus, very similar to SARS and with very similar origins. So really, like SARS, COVID-19 is thought to have emerged as a result of the raising, slaughtering, and preparing of wildlife for consumption. Wildlife meat has always been popular in Guangdong. Demand, however, has increased with wealth and taken on a new character with a greater range of animals on offer, including most species on land, sea, and air. So yes, we can focus in on the wildlife markets of, of China. However, we've got to look even deeper than that because we've got to look at why humans and animals have come in closer contact, wild animals in particular. Obviously, we can get these zoonotic diseases like bird flu from our own domesticated animals, but the really dangerous ones are wildlife because it's these that we're not used to being around. These are the ones that we definitely haven't built up any immunity to. So spread of capitalism and human activity around the world encroaching on more and more areas where wild animals live is, is really probably the key problem. And so deforestation, which means that all the animals that live in these forests, because a lot of the animals are in very thick, thickly forested areas, um, are going to find themselves isolated and coming across humans more often. Now, one example for Ebola, which I find I found very interesting, is scientists have looked at the spread of palm oil plantations in West Africa. And what they found is that the areas where there are palm oil plantations, you actually had some of the first cases of 
of Ebola. And the thing is, is these lovely looking little bats here in the picture, they love palm oil plantations. So a lot of the forests of, of uh, West Africa were being chopped down in order to make way for palm oil plantations. And palm oil is uh, something that's wildly consumed all over the world. It's become more and more popular, a source of great pr profits to capitalists. And by, but these, in these uh, palm oil plantations, you had the bats came to them and sort of hung out, shall we say, and therefore were closer to humans. And they're also closer to chimpanzees. So this was one of the reasons that they think that Ebola emerged where and when it did was because of palm oil plantations. So de deforest, but deforestation for whatever reason, of course, is going to be a, a major problem. This is going to be for mines, for logging, and all these other products that, that capitalism is desperate to have for its various activities. And loss of uh, biodiversity is a real problem. And this is, I find it at first a little bit difficult to understand, but basically if there's not a load of different types of species, the virus can focus in on one species or a few species. And if it just focuses on a few species, and that species happens to be one that could end up with us into humans, then we've got a problem. So really, we need to have more biodiversity so the viruses basically can spread themselves around more. And then they're more likely also to die out if there's more species that they can go. go. I mean, I know that sounds a bit illogical, but they could end up in a species, for example, that is a dead end for them, and then that will cause them cause it to die out. Whereas if they find a species that really is a good host, then they can can expand much greater. And all of this then is, is close to human wild animal context are coming from all this loss of habitat and the expansion. So, and of course, all this relates then to, so one, we're doing all the deforesting for a, a variety of reasons, but really it's also because of our animals as food. Now, of course, we've all, humans have always eaten animals to a certain extent, but we have to look at what, what's been happening recently with animals as food. And there's different, it can happen in the production process, it can happen when these animals are being sold at markets, as you can see in the cages, and it could happen when we're actually eating them. So, and it all really comes down to agri-capitalism, we'll call it, shall we say. Meat is absolutely essential to agri-capitalism. And when you look at the figures here, you know, the amount of meat production is, is, is just increasing, increasing all the time. And we have a picture of the Amazon rainforest over here on, on this slide. And as you can see, all the land that, you know, has been cleared. And the thing is, is that it's for livestock. It's either for li livestock grazing or it's to grow things like soya beans or to feed to livestock. So huge, 80% of the total agricultural land and the amount of land used for agriculture is actually also well into three quarters of the planet practically is taken up by, by land being used for agriculture. An interesting figure I saw somewhere recently was that it, all the land of North and South America, the equivalent of that land is used for either directly or indirectly for meat production. That is sort of the size of the land mass we're, we're actually talking about. So let's look at UK meat production. So in the UK, 70% of land is used for agriculture. Again, a lot. It's funny that you don't often think of that unless you start wandering around the country and you realize how many fields there are. 62.7 for grazing of livestock and 71.8 for the crops for livestock. Again, it's not for growing vegetables or fruit or whatever. It's still focused on things like cattle and sheep and things like that. But I also want to point out about the pheasants in Britain, because that's another thing that's based in the long tradition of uh, the rich wanting to go out to the countryside to shoot some wild birds seems to be something that the English ruling class or the Scottish ruling class for that matter think it's a great thing to do. And when you think that 35 million pheasants are, are raised every year and they feed these on wheat 
it's a hell of a lot of wheat mm. it has to be grown somewhere mm. and one of my friends who's a farmer up in scotland was telling me that on the estate that he works they actually import food for the pheasants mm -hmm. elsewhere in the world people are growing <laughs> food so yeah. that the people in britain the rich of britain can shoot the birds that i mean it really is quite incredible that Sorry. this goes on so and they sort of eat pheasant but it's not really to eat pheasant that they shoot but i mean mm -hmm. obviously it's, it's still related to our use of land the other thing of course mm -hmm. with me is the fact that it's industrialized agriculture and even though the statistics show that the majority of the world's food not me but the majority of the world's food is actually grown by small farmers in the rest of the world largely mm -hmm. it's still the industrialized agriculture is really what sort of takes over the most land and and dominates you know in in many ways and of course because it's done within capitalism the key thing is making profits so animals are treated like any input into the process of production so the crap more crowded the conditions the less money is spent on their care all of that the less money you spend looking after them obviously the more profits there are to make so these kind of conditions just like in for for human beings you know the way humans are exploited at work you know obviously capitalists want to spend as much, little money as possible on things like health and safety these industrialized these farms are actually breeding grounds for for the actual diseases and uh, make it much more easy to jump between animal and animal and to and to humans now the thing about the wildlife trade in china is really it is actually another form of agri-capitalism and because the chinese government they made wildlife domestication part of their rural poverty strategy so because there was a famine back in 1970 there was a a big a big famine and so they needed to find a way in the rural areas so the government was desperate to trying to find ways of stopping rural unrest and they basically encourage people in the rural areas to actually go and hunt wildlife and actually domesticate it and and, and use it and basically make farms the same there are poultry farms or pig farms you now have the same kind of farms raising what were wild animals and uh, here's a pangolin here which is potentially one of the sources of uh, COVID-19 here. Uh, it's one of the animals that's actually farmed. They do hunt as well, but I mean, often, but really most of it actually comes from, from the farms. It's worth $57 billion. That is a lot of money. And it's estimated that there are about 20,000 in these farms. And when you look at you know the, the the demand for this it is coming from the those the chinese who are becoming increasingly wealthy yeah and they've even instituted something called there's something called the wild flavor restaurants and these are a status symbol for mm. the wealthy so mm. that they they want you know they want to be able to eat anything and the more obscure the more rare the more yeah. um, desirable it is. So, so many people in the countryside, the way they can make their living, the way they can escape rural poverty yeah. is by them providing the wealthy with these animals. It turns out that it's really the same in, in West Africa, because even though you do get people in the rural villages actually eating chimpanzees if they find one in the forest or whatever, the biggest demand for chimpanzee and gorilla is from the rich in, in some of the West African countries countries again they want different parts of the chimpanzee or different parts of the gorilla that are considered delicacies or obscure so then the, the people in the villages who are suffering from poverty and struggling to survive will be tempted to, to get these animals to kill these animals to provide them for to uh, to the urban rich mm. but also in china they are used for traditional medicine so the scales of this animal pangolin here is used in a particular traditional chinese medicine so recently china has china has uh, in theory banned the wildlife trade because of COVID-19, but you have to wonder to what extent will they actually be able to do that given the, the amount of money, the amount of people who are actually in their whole livelihoods are caught up in it. Also, though they haven't banned it for traditional medicine, 
Mm. So you can easily see that it could carry on, but they could just claim that it's for traditional medicine and any trade that goes on could be illegal trade under the table sort of thing. But I just find it I just find it hard to believe that China's just going to be able to stop it just like that, even if they really wanted, even if the government really wanted to. So many people in China are arguing that they do want it stopped because it really is only one part of China. It really is just not all Chinese that really are yeah. involved in this by any means or are at all interested in eating wild animals. So I'll move on then to other health issues that come from the way we treat animals in our factory farming. One of these is the use of antibiotics in animals. And this is an example of cattle feeder. It's, it's called a concentrated animal feeding operation. And this one is in the United States. And these are the kind of environments where uh, a lot of the livestock is kept. But antibiotics are used a lot in countries because it promotes growth and therefore more profit. So the quicker you the quicker you can fatten up the animal, the quicker you can get it to market, the more profits there are to be made. But scientists are becoming increasingly worried that these well, animals are becoming resistant to antibiotics mm -hmm. because the more you give either us as humans or animals antibiotics, the more we become resistant to them and they don't actually work. But the worry in terms of human health, I mean, it's bad enough for animal health, is that these the, the actual resistance to the antibiotics could transfer from animals to humans. By so, if we're eating the animals that has these antibacterial resistant bacteria in them, that we could end up becoming more resistant to antibiotics as well. This is still speculation at the moment. I'm not going to state this is actual fact. Scientists right. are investigating this to see to what extent the danger moves from its use of animals to its humans. They know that in humans, overuse of antibiotics is causing a huge problem. But whether or not this can come from animals is, a, is another matter. But it is now, the EU is finally are going to ban the use of antibiotics in animal feed for growth purposes uh, next year but we're not really sure what britain's going to do with that the other health issue of course that, that affects humans is the use of pesticides and synthetic fertilizers and these are of course a key part of factory farming industrial far farming because you, they make it possible to, to produce more crops for less money. So you don't have the same problems of insects destroying your crop or the cost because organic fertilizer are for more expensive than synthetic fertilizers. So all these things are done again to, to make profit, to grow more crops quickly. Now you have to admit that obviously some of these methods have meant that we have increased, we, have grow, we are able to grow more food and feed more people. But I mean, the, but it is a danger. The World Health Organization estimates that over 350,000 people die every year from acute pesticide poisoning. So this, so it's often, of course, with the people who have to work with with these uh, with these things or working on the farms that are in danger. So it's becoming a big problem. And I have one quote here: the data for the last two decades regarding pesticide exposure and human health revealed that several pesticides cause neuronal disorder, degenerative diseases, some affect fetal growth and ca can cause congenital anomalies and others are carcinogenic for humans. Over the past three decades, the indiscriminate use and improper handling of pesticides in agriculture have caused serious human health problems in many developing countries. This was from a study done in India. They really are, these are also a problem and they're a problem and they're used because of our production methods and because our production methods are our capitalists. So this is why we have to say that it is that we do target and as communist group capitalism as the underlying problem of most things and we can clearly see it's the underlying problem for this. So even though people are focusing in COVID-19 on the more immediate issues, or they might look just at the wildlife trade, as you look deeper, you realize it's because we have capitalist methods of production. And for these reasons, the profit motive encourages unsafe profits. 
often the farmers have to, to survive if they're going to compete in the in this kind of system you need to cut costs the meat industry is incredibly powerful capitalism you wouldn't say well you could have a meat industry that's not capitalist in theory however the point is is that current agri-capitalism meat industry forms the the basic part of it so we're mm -hmm. talking about these pig farms as we can see here we're talking about the poultry farms we're talking about the massive livestock farms we're talking about the soy industry to feed all these animals so this is a huge part of capitalism and just like the oil industry does not want to give up say oh we're going to not do look for oil anymore or we're not or the fossil fuel industry doesn't want to give up what they're doing the meat industry is going to continue to fight to try to promote meat eating yeah. and it succeeded because of course meat eating has increased all over the world the other problem is of course capitalism doesn't have to take into account what we call externalities so externalities are they are costs that lie outside the media production process so basically COVID-19 has cost billions billions mm. of pounds mm -hmm. for you know in terms of people's lost income in terms of all sorts of things mm -hmm. but the people who are at the, the cause of it the production methods that led to it in this case the wildlife farms the wildlife markets etc they don't bear any of this cost so it's the same with bird flu you know in this in the in after world war one you know the poultry industry didn't have to pay anything to the fact that millions millions of people died and the other issue of course is it's with capitalism it's growth at all costs you have to have it and they can't survive it has to continue to grow which means it's continuing to expand taking over more and more of the earth leaving less and less wild space left to just let these animals let them be for goodness sake you know humans should just give them their own areas and they can just get on with it and not be constantly encroaching on their land in order to get more and more of these resources that are not necessary for the well-being of everyone they're really only necessary for the growth of capital but then they're not interested in sustainable are they no, interesting <laughs> how do we change it and this is what's so difficult is because there's so many livelihoods which are dependent on these current farming practices and we're not just talking here about the rich we're talking about the working class we're talking about poor the peasants people living in villages and west africa or people poor farmers in china who want to make a bit of money and it's very difficult to just stop these practices you have to change yeah. other things as well mm. so as i mentioned before the wildlife trade is a way of making money for many people selling wild animals to rich consumers is a way to make a living for people who otherwise would struggle so you have to deal with this unequal society you have to deal with yeah. this problem before you can just say oh we've got to stop all this we've got to integrate our whole strategy with dealing with the problem of inequality yeah. this adventurous food this this eating of so-called adventurous animals yeah. it's a western thing as well isn't it oh yeah it's, it's not just something that's mm. chinese i mean no. I remember years ago Jeremy Clarkson on TV talking about these unusual animals that he prided himself on eating. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. it's um, it's something that's been with the the wealthy people in the West as well for yeah. a long time. Yeah. yeah, I think that's an important point because we don't yeah. want to get the idea that oh, it's all China, it's all this. No, as I said right. before, there's many people in China. Most people in China, you know, are not think it's you know a real problem. Mm. And you know, people in all these countries are going to struggle with it. But yes, it's a a practice of all the countries. But it's something that the rich, in particular, yeah. whether that they're in the West or in the in the global South, are. Uh, interested in so this is an example yes it's a menu in a chinese menu but i think you're right you could probably find similar things elsewhere in yeah. uh, europe or the united states i think it seems to be something that the uh, ruling class all over the world likes to do yeah. I mean, yeah. but if you look at the um, some of the banquets uh, the ruling classes had in in the um, late middle ages they yeah. end, uh, 
every conceivable type of bird swans yeah, yeah. bustards doesn't surprise me sets, you name it every 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 every, uh, every bird that was swimming on ponds and rivers mm. every bird that could fly they, they ate a lot mm. and it's very different from you know i mean a lot of people if you're desperate for food will end up eating all sorts of things but you know this yeah, it's not true. out of desperation is it it's just out no, of, no. of status and to show their wealth really isn't it okay so what to do so this is really just the first part of the pamphlet the second part of the pamphlet goes on to talk about other health issues and food but so this is part one but mm. I still, still think we can look at some of the things that we need to do. Of yeah. course, all easier said than done. So we do need to end agri-capitalism and factory farming. Mm. Without taking necessarily a vegetarian or vegan stance, I do think that we can all agree that there does have to be a massive reduction mm -hmm. in meat eating. A lot of people will be resistant to this. But I think that for the reasons that we've just talked about, it's essential yeah. because of the nature of it. Mm. There are other ways of raising meat to eat, but those, are, of course, are much more time consuming. And with, so really, you could only, if you're going to use those other methods, you wouldn't be able to produce as much. So therefore, really, you would still have to greatly reduce the amount yeah. of meat people eat and people don't need it for right. their diets i mean if anything it's bad for them isn't it yes. looking at health so yeah. yeah that's right so the other thing is stop encroachment on wild animal habitats which means ending really the you know in particular the the, the rainforest which is where a lot of these species are and this is you know the palm oil plantations the logging Again, all things that aren't necessary, but are there because they're big business and they're making someone profits. The mm. wildlife trade, yes, we need to stop it, but it can only be done, as I mentioned before, once you, you have to integrate it with alternative livelihoods. It would be quite difficult and would be seen in some ways as almost an attack on the poor, but that's mm. why it has to be integrated with finding other occupations other livelihoods because the thing yeah. is a lot of times people are involved in live life trade because capitalism has already destroyed the kind of farming practices they were quite happily doing before mm. yeah mm. um and this is where i would say agroecology comes in so agroecology is meant to be basically going back to traditional farming mm. practices where right. you're much more growing many more crops side by side or if you do have livestock they're integrated in with the grazing in a woodland or you know they're not you know that's not mm. for factory farming so this kind of thing most i do wonder though although i don't think meat is particularly healthy i do wonder whether the lab grown thing is um could could help as an alternative to actual you know meat i think i think it could be but I think we just have to, because we haven't talked about the danger of processed foods yet for health. <laughs> right, yeah. So I think that uh, yeah, yeah. it depends how it's done. If it's done using the kind of ingredients that are used in, 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 in processed food, you know, lots, mm. you know, then really then you're only exchanging one problem for another. Yeah. But it's not, it could be, but that's the thing. It, it can't be done under capitalism. Because mm. of capitalism. Absolutely, yeah. 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 I'm I just think thinking of the sort of ethical side of it, you know, for yeah. the animals. Yes. Yeah. You know, that's right. It's, yeah, it's quite a limited thing. Yeah. But you also have to look at the different societies around the world. And, and, and mm. so it is a question of people also having <laughs> to change from with, within yeah. their own society. Yeah, I can yeah. see that. Yeah. And for some of these, agroecology is already part of their society, just a question of yeah, yeah. capitalism. But that could, agroecology could include livestock. But yeah. yes, as long as if you're looking at alternatives to meat, then it's got to be, it can't be done for profit because then we don't know what Absolutely. kind of production yeah. methods are going to be using. Mm. So then, obviously, for as anarchists, 
we believe strongly in this much got to be much more local and collective control of food yeah you have to know what we're growing what we're yeah. eating where it comes from and not just go into the supermarket and be buying stuff that we really have no idea that's what we're eating which of course is more links we need more links between farmers and consumers and I think that's happening a little bit with some of the mutual aid groups that are have, have emerged in the pandemic. Mm. There is talk more of going directly to farmers, you know, to to buy food directly and having more of a link to farmers. Mm. All right. Um, lastly, um, I think we've got to have certain basic principles here that with COVID-19, people have sort of forgotten about the ecological crisis that we're also facing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and really, that could be even worse than the crisis yeah, we're facing. Right. Yeah. But that is why a basic principle, I think, has to be the health of humans depends on the health of the planet and other species. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to see ourselves as part of this planet. And yeah. We're connected, aren't we? Yeah. That's right. We're all connected. And mm -hmm. we, and I think it's, I mean, maybe it's something humans themselves have done, but it's certainly become much, much worse under capitalism. Yeah. That, um, you know, this alienation from the rest of the planet and other species has just reached epidemic proportions. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Mm. So we have to work in harmony with the rest of nature. Mm. And uh, I, there was one example in the pamphlet that, I think often we don't realize that we think we can dominate. Humans think they can dominate. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. capitalism in particular thinks it can dominate. And yeah. any use of technology, you know, the more money they throw at something, the more technology they think mm -hmm. they're just going to keep nature under control. But yeah. there was a book called When Things Bite Back. And basically it's the idea that you've got to be working with nature. Yes. You can't expect to be able to control it without some re some unintended consequences mm. something murray butchin wrote about i believe he, yes. i haven't read much about it but yeah i understand that he did do you yeah. remember any examples or anything that he might not have specifically no but i just i can remember him talking about it in like videos i've seen on online like interviews and stuff yeah. and of course i think like when he wrote the ecology of freedom it, it would have been a big part of that as well yeah yeah mm. I tried to read The Ecology of Freedom, but I didn't get very far. I mean, I had one example, which was that is about, um, it's not directly related to food, but it's to do with the control of fire. Right, uh, yeah. Fire suppression. And, uh, I mean, there are some things that we're just not going to be able to control. I mean, earthquakes, for yeah, example, yeah. or volcanoes. <laughs> and whatever you do, you can monitor them, you can try to forecast them. But I'm afraid if a volcano goes... We've had it, really, are the yeah, people yeah. that live near one. Um, yeah. it's, very, it's very difficult. But, I mean, there are thing, other things you can actually, you know, try, you can look at, for example, mm -hmm. like, so what they, use, they try to control is forest fires. Yeah, yeah. Because a lot of it's to do with property damage, isn't it? Yeah. So they didn't want, you know, especially, I think in California recently, with the recent fires in Northern California, property, you know, the people who owned the big houses out in the forest, you know, people were moving out into the forest. Yeah. Um, they actually ha had uh, uh, employed their own firefighting service. Mm -hmm. <laughs> To, to stop the fires, you know, to protect their property. But what they're finding is that you have, you can't really have a policy of fire suppression because the fires only get worse. Right. But you, you need to have some forest fires to clear out the undergrowth. Yes, yes. So you don't, the undergrowth doesn't build up. And if the undergrowth doesn't build up, then the fire, then you can't have these really horrendous fires. Yeah. So, I mean, this is just one example that you've got to think, you've got to think, well, can we really control this or do we have to accept, you know, I'm, I'm quite worried, for example, that bats are beginning to uh, feature quite a lot in the discussion of uh, zoonotic diseases. Well, what happens if, uh, if, if we decide to go on a mass extinction of bats? Yeah. We have no idea what the reper repercussions with that, of that would be. 
I mean, obviously mm. for bats, it's not a great thing, but, but you know, for, you know, ecosystems, you know, you have no yeah, idea exactly. what role bats play mm. and you could end up making things much, much worse in this sort of yeah. effort to suppress, you know, the, the virus rather than dealing mm. with, you know, the issue of human animal contact. Mm. Yeah. And of course, as always, we finish with, we need to end capitalism. Yeah. <laughs> Again, uh, easier said than done, but I'm afraid there is no short. There's no shortcuts. No. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's becoming ever more urgent. Yeah. That we actually, for both, you know, climate change and zoonotic diseases, that this is becoming absolutely imperative. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. So, thank you for listening. Is there any questions or any other comments on any part? Yeah, I just want to say, Bonnie, earlier you said we've got a problem, you know, with basically with food, COVID and everything. You're in good company because the head of committed, um, research at Goldman Sachs, one of the biggest investor banks, of course, said this. We had a problem with livestock going into this. We now have a very serious problem. They even know this. And I, it makes me ask the question, if we had give such subsidies to farmers, why can we not do that to transition to plant farming, which yeah. is better for the animals, planet and all of us? Yeah. And, and you have to ask if um, animal farming has any part in our future, really. Yeah. Yeah. Because of all of these problems, because the next um, pandemic apparently predicted is an antibiotic resistance. Yeah. More animals in yeah. Europe have antibiotics than hu humans do. Yeah. Uh, and this is going to be the next big one. Yeah. So oh. I just think, I don't know, even if the head of these, um, the banks are turning away from investing in animal foods and looking more at plant foods. <laughs> I still don't hold out much hope that they'll, no. you know, they could yeah. have done something by now, couldn't they? A bit better and a bit stronger than this, but they haven't. But, but it's always implicating, we'll do this, we'll do that, but they never do. They never do, yeah. No, but that, never, that's the other thing, as you say, you have to help farmers transition. Yes, exactly. You know, obviously, there's the big farmers, and, you know, I don't think there's any place for the big industrial capitalist farmer. But, you know, there could be cooperatives, there could be other forms. <laughs> There's collective lots farms, for goodness yeah. sake, if they're run properly, not like the Chinese or Russian ones, but, you know, yeah. the idea of like the Spanish Revolution, they had collective farms, yeah, you absolutely. know, where people, but people, yes, you'll need support, you'll need resources, to, you'll need land. Yeah. That's the other thing. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. it all depends on land reform. People have to get, we have to get hold of land and land has to be yeah. held in mm. common rather so than left yeah. to private ownership. Yeah. Mm. I was listening to someone talking early, um, earlier at Earthling Ed at Vegan. He was saying things could be do done so much better, such as vertical farming and hydrophonic systems of agriculture. Well, I don't really know what that is, yeah. but um, um, it seems yeah. like they're all discussing better ways of going forward, which is a bit hopeful, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. you know, <laughs> whether it will be done, you know. Mm. I've just put a few resources here. One of the books that was very interesting was this book called Spillover, Animal Infection. Yeah. And this yeah. was written in 2013. And, I mean, it could have been written today, which is what's worrying. Um, but oh. if you look at some of these other, yeah. I mean, Land Workers Alliance and Via Campesina are two organizations that are looking at what you say, you know, about what are the other ways of doing things. And uh, they're, they're trying yeah. to, you know, get hold of land and have small scale agriculture, much more focus on, you know, plant based, uh, you know, plants and vegetables and fruit. And, uh, and Via Campesina is an international organization. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, these are all these organizations exist. And they'd be ready. They'd be have huge, like what you said. There's these various things people are talking about. Well, all these organizations are talking about them, but they don't have the land, they don't have the power, and they don't have the resources. Mm. It's a shame because things could be so much more optimistic, you know. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to stop on an unoptimistic, but I, but I do think at least maybe we become more aware of the relationship, yeah. but hope to food yeah. and everything 
and yeah. uh, we can only hope that uh, and obviously in the anarchist communist group we'll be trying to go mm -hmm. forward with some of these and uh, yeah. the more we i look around the more i find that there are loads of different groups are doing stuff you know there's a group uh, that's located out in the thames estuary which is talks about uh, crops not shops Mm -hmm. and uh you know there's community gardens there's you know all sorts of things you know it's just that we have to you know we have to cult cultivate these literally we have to yeah. you know make these more and more but as you say we're not going to be able to make it this transition because mm. too many people too many people's livelihood are so bound up in it mm. yeah not to mention too many people are susceptible to all the um uh, a lot of people work in yeah, I was just going to say that a lot of people working in uh, the chicken farms in this country and the um, animal um, factories are getting seriously ill, aren't they? They've got yeah. COVID. So yeah. they're trying to shut that. Only this week this has happened. Ah. Um, so it's not good for them either. No, no, no. no. I mean, that is, I didn't focus too much on that. It's only mentioned mm -hmm. in passing, but yes, you really, you could do a whole thing just on the health risk people working in the food industry yeah yeah, yeah. you know is is really you know is is really mm -hmm. horrendous